Some of you have wives, some of you have girlfriends, some of you have both, and they'll get you in trouble. But if you have to run, 41 years in the classroom, I'm dealing, I'm used to dealing with a captive but hostile audience. Alright. Okay, 1936. Alright? The United States adopted the M1 Garand rifle. So Springfield was now basically, you know, it's up to top to leave, but it was going to be a secondary uh, firearm. Uh, Springfield Armory was converting to making M1s. They had made a lot of receivers, so in 1937, 38, 39, they still assembled rifles. Okay? A lot of them were for Camp Perry. They were 1903 A1s because they had made that the official service rifle as a gimmick to help all the uh, target shooters. Most soldiers never saw an A1. They got the straight stock, S stock rifle, and that was it. But in 1941, early 1941, the Marine Corps was told, you're going to grow. Now, the Marine Corps in the First World War was only at brigade strength, which is about one-fourth of the division. Now, they were told, you're going to be an entire division of Marines with all the supporting arms, okay? So they're basically being told, you got to quadruple. Now, when they're going to quadruple, they're going to need a lot of weapons. Here's the problem. The Army is going, he can't have ours. So now where are you going to get them? The Navy. You belong to the Navy, go talk to the Navy. What the Navy did was they sat around and said, well, every ship has an arms room, but they really need 250 rifles aboard a battleship. Maybe they can get by with 25. So we'll take away 225, put 25 in storage for the next battleship we're going to build, and give 200 to the Marine Corps. And they went to destroyers. How many are in a destroyer? Maybe there's 25 rifles. Eh, maybe they need six. Okay, take the rest, send them to the Marine Corps. So the Marines started getting more and more O3s, even though officially they were supposed to have M1s, the Army wasn't giving them any M1s, all right? So the Marines are going to be going to go to battle with the O3, okay? Not because they wanted, not because they were in love with the gun from the First World War, it's because that's all they had available for them. Now, the first rifle I'm going to show you, I want you to ignore the scope right now. This rifle has marine provenance. Unfortunately, the previous owner wanted to have a sniper version. So he went to good old Bob McKinnon, who used to be president of his club, and had him mount a unural commercial scope on this thing and give him an A1 stop. The barrel is a Sedgley USMC barrel marked 11, sorry, 841, okay? Now, if you're looking for a rifle of Marine Corps provenance, the best thing to do is to contact Springfield Research. Because just because it's one serial number off doesn't mean that yours is authentic. If a rifle has a Sedgley Marine Corps barrel dated 1941, odds are very good the Marines had it. If it's dated 42, pretty good odds, it's Marine. If it's 43, maybe. If it's 44, probably not. What happened in 1944 is the Marines had really been fully equipped with the M1, they still had some Springfield barrels, and in 1946 they decided to get rid of anything related to the Springfield. In Philadelphia Ordnance Depot, they took their Sedgley barrels and they sold them as barrels. For some reason, the Marines had a whole stock of them at Thule in Utah. There, they hit them with hammers and bent them and sold them as scrap for pennies. And gunsmiths bought them and straightened them out. So, when you buy a rifle with a 1944 Sedgley, take a look at the hammer marks, okay? Anyway, this particular rifle is also a low number. The Marine Corps never pulled the low numbers out of, out of service. The Army did because it had more than enough rifles. But what the Marines did is when a rifle came in for repair to get a new barrel, they would cut a hatcher hole to improve its safety. And they would add a double heat treated bolt to increase its safety. But they continued to use low number Springfields. Like I said, this particular one, Bob McKinnon fixed up with a uneural scope, and I bought it from my friend, and, you know, it was going to be a shooter, 
And then, belonging to this wonderful club, a guy at a table somewhere along this wall had a Marine Corps sniperscope for sale. So I immediately bought it, went home, it fit on the rifle. The next meeting, I brought my commercial uniscope and sold it for what I paid for my Marine Corps sniperscope. There's lots of these out there. The Marines bought a lot of them. And they put very few on rifles. When they did put them on a rifle, they used a National Match Springfield with a star gauge barrel. If you want to build a good fake, that's what you do. The scopes are around because when the Marine Corps in 1941 adopted this and sent it out into the field with the Marine Raider Battalions, Carlson and Edson, they came back with, it's no good. We can't see beyond 150 yards in the jungle. We don't do 1,000 yard shots. All right? So a lot of these got sent back, and it's not until Korea that they're put to use when they were firing from one mountaintop to another. And in Vietnam, some of these were still around. They mounted them on Model 70 Winchesters for sniping. And in one case, Carlos Hatcock mounted one of these on a, on a Browning 50 caliber machine gun. And firing semi-auto, he was knocking out people at 1,000 yards, okay? What are they worth? Okay. Two years ago, I think, Dave, I, I sent you a message off the Allentown Gun Show. Yeah. The guy had one mounted that he wanted $2,750 for the rifle and the scope. You know, it was a fake, but it was there. A couple of months ago at Mount Bethel, one guy had the scope and he wanted $5,000 for it. Okay, so I can't tell you one way or the other. Um, but 1941, the Marines were looking at a sniper rifle. The Army wasn't. We're going to get into that. All right, 1941. The British government needs, needs firearms. We're giving them a half a million 1917 Enfields. But we're going to keep some for ourselves, too. They go to Reddington and they go, can you make us 303 rifles? They go to Savage. They go, we want a 303 rifle. They go to Long Branch. Long Branch and Savage say, we'll build you number four Enfields. Remington is like, maybe we can modify a Springfield. So they start experimenting with how can we make one of these in 303. The first problem was the magazine capacity. Now a 17 Enfield was designed to hold five rounds of 303. Since it's a rim cartridge, it can hold six rounds of 30 odd six. But if you start out with five rounds of 30 odd six, you're not going to get five rounds of 303 unless you extend the magazine. Then they wanted to modify the barrel so it takes a number four spike bayonet. So they were fooling around with all this stuff. And then in September of 1941, under Len Lease, the U.S. government took over Remington and said, no, just make 03s. And the British said, we're good with that. We can use 30 caliber rifles with the home guard. They already have 17 Enfields, so we can give them, we can put these in our war reserve. If there's an invasion, we can issue Springfields to the Home Guard. They already have 30 caliber ammunition if those units have. They were making it on the old Rock Island. Right, now, here's the other problem. The machinery, in theory, notice I said in theory, when Rock Island stopped production in 1919, they took all their wonderful machinery, which was properly gauged, everything else, crated it up, and put it aside for war reserve. That if they had to, they could take everything out and start making 03s again. Meantime, Springfield continued to make 03s. Well, in 1941, Rock Island, or, I mean, sorry, Remington gets all the Rock Island machinery. And as they pull it out of the boxes and they start working, they find out a lot of stuff is out of, out of spec. Now, how did that happen? Easily. During those tight money years for the Department of Defense, or War Department as it was called in those days, if you were in Springfield Armory and your gauges were no longer in spec, you could spend a lot of money repairing them, or you could go to Rock Island, find a corresponding box, open it up, put your used part inside, take out the Rock Island part, and go back to work, okay? 
So what started to happen was they realized that a lot of the gauges and everything else were not up to, to speed, and they cranked out 1,500 test rifles. I wish I had one of them. They are the holy grail of Remington 03s. Now, to prevent the problem of the First World War, where Rock Island made rifles number one to 290,000, and Springfield made rifle number one to one million, whatever, they said you got to start at three million. Remington, all Remington rifles start at three million. Okay. Now, the very early Rock uh, very old Remingtons are supposed to be almost direct copies of a good Rock Island, with the finger grooves, the lightning cuts on the sight. In no time at all, Remington engineers are going, this is crazy. There's a lot of shortcuts we can make. Now, this particular rifle is a pretty low Remington, okay? The barrel date is 1141, <clears throat> okay? The barrel date, all right? It has a hole on the right side, like an original Springfield, but it also has a hatcher hole on the left side, which was an improvement in the 1930s on all Springfields. So it's got two holes, okay? Now, it's got a finger groove stock, which is unusual on a Remington, but the cartouche is gone. So, is it 100% the way it left the factory? I don't know, but it's a low number. It is in the 20,000 range, okay? And like I said, barrel is 1141. The so, lightning cuts then? Huh? Lightning cuts? The lightning cuts were one of the first things they eliminated. Well, you very rarely see a Remington with lightning cuts. Let me see if I can find you a rifle with lightning cuts so you know what I'm talking about. Somebody had, there's a couple of O3s here. Um, I'm at the and you run out the real fast. Mark Schnell. Mark Schnell, Mark Schnell. All right. Yeah, lightning cuts on right here. On under the sight base. Uh, Springfield had dropped them already in the 1930s. So in a way they were told, no, don't worry about that. All right. Now, soon after. They got the contract to start producing as many of them as possible, all right? This is the pride of my Remington collection. Angus Laidlaw got this from a fellow writer in, in the, uh, from the American Rifle. This particular rifle, which has the hole on the right side, hole on the left side, no lightning cuts, Stock and it has the original cartouche from Remington. Okay, inspector marks, everything else. This gun was probably proof fired, put in a crate, sent to England, put in their war reserve. In the 1950s, they pulled it out, sent it to Birmingham. They proofed it for export, returned to the United States, and somebody put it in a safe. It is a all perfect original 1241 barrel 03 made by Remington. The Remington engineers started pointing out right away there's a lot of shortcuts. If you give us approval, first of all, what do you need this crazy sight for? There's lots simpler sights, and if we can give you a sight that's similar to what's on an M1, that'd make it out easier for troop training. Rather than learning how to use a peep sight on your M1 and getting issued one of these. Now, why would you be issued one of these? Because, well, the Marines needed them. Because they went to Guadalcanal with O3s. Now, if you saw the HBO series, The Pacific, the prop room gave them all O3 A3s. Anyway, okay? You'd think they would have some close-up scenes with guys with O3s and the guys in the back would have O3 A3s. But no, no, no. They all had O3 A3s. Um, what did the Marines do with it? Well, after Guadalcanal, well, do, well, near the end of Guadalcanal, Marines started to engage in what we used to refer to as midnight requisition. That meant you slipped into the Army Supply Depot and stole their M1s. Because the Marines at Guadalcanal soon realized, with a Springfield, I have a weapon that's equal to what a Japanese has. 
and as we teach you in the military, if you, if you enter a fair fight, you've already made a major tactical mistake, okay? So, the Marines wanted M1s. When the Marines were being rotated out of Guadalcanal, as they were going aboard the troop ships, the MPs were standing there and go, no, no, M1 Army, M1 Army, <laughs> all right? They go to New Zealand to retrofit, retrain, re-equip. Their O3s are taken away from them. And the O3s are given to New Zealand for their home guard. And the, that releases 303 rifles for the New Zealand troops that are fighting in North Africa and other places. So you, there's a lot of O3s ended up in New Zealand. Whether they're still going to be there next week, I don't know. Okay. Now, when the rifle was going to be shipped to England, it was supposed to be supplied with an oiler, front sight cover, a web sling, a bayonet, and a scabbard. When the guns came back, they didn't have any of that stuff. So that stuff must have been, must have been shipped separately. Okay? Now, the web sling. One of the worst concoctions that anybody ever created is the Model 1923 sling. Okay? At the end of World War I, there was complaints that the leather was rotting away. It was a great sling for target shooters, but it just wasn't any good for surviving. So some guy invented what's called a 1923 sling. Now, I paid a dollar for this at Linden War Surplus because I had it marked as U.S. Army sling. I got home, couldn't figure out heads or tails of this stupid thing. It was not until many years later when I got Campbell's book in which he shows you how to put this on. And if you go on the internet and you put down Model 1923 Sling, they will show you the same page from the same book. But that's the only source in the world of how to figure out how to put this crazy contraption on. Uh, this one here was treated with mildew rot treatment. That's why it's green. They were made happy. And all of them had the same marking, SM-42. And all the Army manuals in World War II listed as an alternate sling. Uh, Dave has one on his rifle too, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're all marked SM-42. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> they were hated by everybody. Somebody on the internet when they found one picture, one picture of troops actually using it. And it's a guy in the first special service force, either Canadian or American. He's got one on his Thompson submachine gun. But you never see them, you know. So, okay, the engineers started looking at this and going, mm-mm, mm-mm. So they started making recommendations. And the recommendations were accepted. And there's a model that a lot of books don't mention. The O3 Modify. They were only made by Remington. O3 Modify. This is an O3 modified. The hole on the right, no longer there. But it does have the hole on the left. Let me see if I can move the bolt and make it easier. The way you spot an O3 modified, you'll see this hole in the back. Rather than drill and tap a dead end hole, they just went <clears throat> right through. Okay, it creates an ugly hole. Some of you go, I've seen that before. Yeah, every O3A3 has it. Okay, but they just went straight through. They eliminated some machining steps on the inside for a part called the bolt stop. And they started looking at the expensive parts like trigger guards and everything else and going, we can make these cheaper. And thanks to Jay, because every now and then you'll get people who will tell you, no, Remington O3s are all milled parts, all milled parts. Anything else needs to be rebuilt. This is an O3 modified. Okay? Stamp trigger housing, stamp band, uh, stamp butt plate. They were starting to change. They were starting to modify the gun to make it easier for production. Now, why do we still need the Springfield? Grenade launching. As late as 1944, in a typical American rifle squad, you had um, nine guys with M1s, two with BARs, and one with a Springfield. Because they couldn't, they at first did not develop a good grenade launcher that wouldn't wreck an M1. So you needed a grenade launcher that would clamp on to fire any tank grenades and anti personnel grenades. They made 100,000 of the grenade launchers. They're next to impossible to find. I've seen two in 50 years of collecting. 
One belonged to my friend, he wasn't going to let it go. The other is a modified one that the guy's trying to sell to me for $1,000 all the time. And it was made for a 1917 Enfield and sent back and modified to fit in number three. But that was one of the critical needs for a Springfield was grenade launching until they could create a good grenade launcher for the M1. So the Springfield was also used by support troops. And if you look at official photographs from the war, Signal Corps engineers and MPs are often armed with O3s. The goal under General Marshall was that all frontline infantry, Marine or Army, would have M1s. That was the goal, that frontline infantry would have M1s. And by 1943, they're achieving that. Like I said, the Marines went to Guadalcanal, with O3s, they never used them again as their main battle rifle. It's now going to be the M1. Uh, the Army, same thing. By the time they land in North Africa, M1s. When they go to Guadalcanal, because the job of the Marines is to kick in the door so the Army can get in, okay? The Army came in with M1s. So this is your O3 modified. Now, they still needed more and more rifles, the Navy in particular. So we're going to get to the next collectible, which is this, which some of you guys probably pass up. Okay, it's clearly marked on the bottom here. Um, dummy training rifle, Mark 1, USN, Paris Dunn Corporation, Clorinda, Iowa. In 1942, the Army wanted, ordered 35,000 dummy rifles. They didn't click, they didn't do anything. The Navy came along and goes, we want 190,000. But we want them to be able to work the bolt, and they'll click. So, this is an early one. I know how I know it's early? Walnut. Early ones had walnut stocks, and then the government said, no, we need walnuts for real guns. So they used the cheap, so you'll see these with real light wood. And they were a little cheaper, the government was happy. They had a pseudo O3 sight. But most, most interesting, they all came with a bayonet plastic, so now it's going to be sticking on me, and won't come out of the scabbard. Okay. Um, the scabbard is marked USN Mark I. The scabbards are the, the survived greatly. You'll find a lot of them out there with, with real bayonets in them. This one here, I have two of these. This one here is broken, which is common. The other one is mint, and that's why it stays mint. That's why I didn't bring it. Uh, this is 75-year-old plastic. It's a plastic blade, and they could train recruits with it and uh, not and have the real rifles off to where they're needed. November of 1945, they were declared obsolete, and the government sold them for $7.50. You got the rifle, you got the bayonet, and you got the scabbard. Now, as a baby boomer kid, born in 1947, I know in the early 50s we used to find these things for sale in army surplus stores like crazy. And parents would buy them for you as a toy gun, and we'd beat the shit out of them. So, finding one in good condition is a challenge. The bayonet just disintegrates. The scabbards are all over the place. But it's a bit of history. Now, what's the advantage of getting one of these? Right? You got one, right, Dave? Yeah. The advantage of it is whenever you go to these crazy places like the MTA show and they go, no live guns or ammunition, you can use this for your World War I exhibit, you can use it for your World War II exhibit. It is an authentic piece of military. Now, what do they sell for? At the MTA show, I've seen them for $100, I've seen them for $150, I went on the internet, IMA just sold one of these with bayonet and scabbard for $695. Get a real one for that. All right? Well, the engineers at Remington finally convinced the government they could produce a good rifle, a lot cheaper, and they created what's called the O3A3, which, of course, is very common because there were so many of them made that weren't used. Okay, if you collect O3s, your biggest problem with O3s is wear and tear. Biggest problem for collecting O3A3s is Bubba. <coughs> Who bought this for 12, was it 12, what, 1295? 14. 14.95. $14 small, unserviced, it's classified as unserviceable 
small non-functional part may be missing that's suitable for firing live ammunition. <laughs> I got one hit a scratch on the stock. <laughs> now, if you're lucky, the guy pulled the stock off, bought a phagin or other stock on, hunted with it, and when he sold it to you, he goes, oh, here's the extra parts, and you could just take out your screwdriver and you're back in business. On the other hand, other guys went and cut them, cold blued them, jeweled the bolt. They, I used to have an NRA publication, How to Sporterize, your 0383, of course. Ah. You know, for us collectors. But uh, if you do get one for shooting, and you can get your hands on a C stock that was made for World War II, it makes a big difference. You get a C stock, it's much more comfortable, uh, nice rifles. Now, the rifling. Remington had machinery for making four groove rifling. So the specification was four groove rifling, which was also what the specification was for the Springfield. Smith Corona was also given a contract, the typewriter people, to make these, and they subcontracted with high standard to make barrels for them. And then they called up the government and they go, we got a little problem. Uh, they can give us four groove barrels, but they're also making six groove barrels. Right. Can we change the spec and take six groove barrels? And they were told, okay, so you might get a Smith Corona with a six group barrel. Remington came with four group barrels, and of course their engineers went to work on that too and said, well, we can do it too. So they tested it and they said, it's somewhat it's good. Yeah, why not? So you can get a Remington with a four groove or a two groove, Smith Corona, four groove, and if you're lucky, a six groove barrel. But there, uh, I was teaching junior ROTC to shoot. Uh, many years ago, and I put C stock on my 03A3, and the kids were doing really good. But the Marine instructor was funny. We put him, he, oh, yeah, I've heard about this gun. You know, they're very accurate, everything else. He gets into firing position. Boom! I'm waiting, I'm waiting for him. He's trying to figure out why he hasn't reloaded. <laughs> <laughs> the whole concept of manually operated was totally alien to him. Okay? Well, as soon as they get these rifles out, the government decides, we need sniper rifles. We need sniper rifles. As Brophy puts it, the 03A4 is a poor excuse for a sniper rifle. They are not hand-selected, honed actions. All they did was take these receivers off the line, move the markings to the side so they don't interfere with the sight base, put a sight base on it, and mount a scope. Now, this one here is from one of the early production, okay? The stocks came from Keystone Company and from Springfield Armory. It's a C stock, like you use for target shooting, okay? The reason they picked the Weaver scope, it's a crappy scope. They know it's a crappy scope. Because Lyman was making optics for artillery pieces and other more high priority items. And the Weaver Company said, well, we can meet the contract. So Weaver was told, okay, Give us the scopes. First thing Weaver did is they called all their distributors. Give us back the scopes you didn't sell. And they brought back all their Model 330 scopes. And then they made this one. They called the M73B1. And that's the scope. It's a tiny little scope. It's not really great. It didn't survive well with the humidity in the, in the Pacific and everything else. It was all that was available. Now, well, didn't they learn about that when they were in sniper school? Well, there was no sniper school. <laughs> The rifle got sent to your unit. Who's the best shot in the platoon? Give him the sniper rifle. All right. So it has it, it had its limitations. And when I was a young collector and I made up my bucket list of you know Springfields, I had four. I wanted a Springfield. I wanted a Rock Island A1. Didn't know whether it existed or not, but I wanted one. An 03A3 with Smith Corona and an 03A4 Remington. And I'll be the happiest kid in the world. I didn't really expect to find one of these, okay? Now, when I was stationed at Fort Hood, I was assistant company armor. And in 1971, we got a batch of manuals to put in our little library, and one of them was for an 03A4. I'm like, this is 19, they still got these guns somewhere. So of course I kept the manual somewhere in my attic. Anyway, uh, the gun stayed in the system for quite a while, but they, they made some modifications to it, uh, the scope. The scope was the weak point, so they uh, they did that. Now, 
They then make another request for more sniper rifles, and they tell them, okay, when you get to serial number 4 million, uh, make the first 1,200 guns sniper rifles. Sure thing. They go to the factory. Uh, when you get to 4 million, make sure they, oh, we passed 4 million two weeks ago. Oh. Oh. The, the specs say 4 million. Okay. So we have what's called the Z series. I don't have one. But it's Z, 4 million and 1, Z, 4 million and 2. Okay? All right, they have, okay, that order goes out. They get another order, more sniper rifles. And they get to this group here. You see the stock? I hate these stocks. Scan stock. But what's nice about this one, it's original to the rifle because it has all the Remington inspector marks on it. They, but here's the other problem, it's got a two-groove barrel, because just to make an 0383, you stick a scope on it, it's a sniper rifle, and you give it a pistol grip, all right? Whenever you see a rifle with this kind of a grip, it's a replacement part, unless it's on a sniper and it has the inspector marks and the cutout for the bolt. So this is, uh, now here's the thing, I've seen pictures of 82nd Airborne on, on D-Day, and you see this particular model, paratrooper standing there with the scant stock. So we know that these did get out there, did get issued, all right? Now, that manual that I had on the 03A4, it looked like this, M84 scope. That was the way they upgraded them after the war. Now, by time Korea, they put, a, they put a better quality scope on it. Now, this particular rifle, from the serial number range, it probably had a two-groove barrel. It's got a Smith Corona barrel. So it probably went into the arsenal, got reconditioned. They put a C-stock on it, uh, put a Smith Corona four-groove barrel on it. And when I bought this gun, as a young collector, I learned your friend or other people's divorces. Um, one of my buddies had an alimony payment due, and he happened to have this rifle. <laughs> so he called me. Yeah. And it's an M84. <laughs> it's an M84 scope. And you notice the trigger guard. That's another thing. After the Aleutian campaign, they found out some guys were shooting their rifles when they put their glove finger into the trigger guard. So, if you want to be a collector of, of, of O3A3s, well, I have to have the early trigger guard and the late trigger guard. That's about it, you know. Two groove, four groove, six groove, you know. Um, nice guns. Um, after the war, what were they going to do with all the O3A3s? Well, they're obviously obsolete. And they tried to make a national match rifle out of them to sell to civilians. And what they did was, if you want to maximize your O3A3, get a C-stock, and get a mill trigger guard, the stamped ones dig into the wood as you keep firing, and it, it affects the accuracy. So if you want to upgrade, they also made a change in the trigger guards. They added some more sheet metal so it wouldn't dig into the wood as much. But one important change is put a mill trigger guard on it. Uh, the O3A3 National Match was a flop, and M1s were doing well. So, war ends, and what's going to happen after, okay, after the war, parts are all over the place. Parts are all over the place. Because the government, you know, just kept making them because they thought they were going to need them. And then they sold them off real cheap. So, when I started collecting at age 18, I got my first Springfield, Rock Island. It had a 1944 high standard barrel. And I told the guy, I'm looking for an A1, come back next week. I come back next week, he gave me a stock from an A4 sniper, but hey, it looked cool, you know. And I went to the range, and I was just amazed, you know. I had to fire 22s, okay, I got the repo, but I was getting tight groups, everything else. It was just a nice, nice rifle. And um, you, you find one with a high standard barrel, that's, that's, that's nice. They're really a quality uh, O3. By the 1960s, a lot of these, okay, the CMP was the, of course, the best place to get rifles, okay? But there was a company called National Ordnance, 
They bought up all those surplus parts, and they had receivers made that were cast. You can't load them with stripper clips. They didn't bother putting that in. They just put all GI parts on a rifle like this. And I remember as a young collector, some of my friends bought them. They were like, oh, wow. And then they realized they were an bought piece of history. They got a, a, a repro. Um, the best story I heard on these was, I might have been Sark, I'm not sure, okay, it was a company. There was a, a, a school that had a drill team, the 03 A3s. And they wanted them nickel plated. So they made a deal. You give us your rifles, and we'll give you nickel plated rifles back at no charge. <laughs> so they turned in all their Remingtons and Smith Coronas and got nickel plated national ordnance. All right? That's probably the best use of the national ordnance guns. But uh, the police department in my town, they nickel plated their rifles and they painted the stocks white and everything else. Uh, they were all over the place. 03 A3s were, again, were very common. Uh, price range on them goes crazy. I've, I've been to the Oak Show and others. One guy will have it for 600, another guy wants 1200. They're all over the place. So, national ordinance, from a collector point of view, no. But if you want to shoot, or if you're a reenactor, you want to run around the woods and drop it a lot of times, it's not that bad. All right? The next one here, and it's really neat. I asked for Gibbs rifles, I got three of them. Three Gibbs rifles in this club. All right? Now, who knows a lot about Gibbs would rather give the talk than me? <laughs> Will? A little bit. A little bit. Go ahead. The yeah. Gibbs rifles. There's one here. John, you got yours right from the... I got it from Val Forget. Val Forget gave you yeah. the Gibbs. Yeah. Okay, here's... You can use this as an example. Gibbs Navy Arms. Okay. What they did basically was... They... Uh, Bought a bunch of parts, and they uh, took uh, decommissioned and dewadded 03 A3 receivers, and they rewadded them. Uh, and the way they were dewadded was the barrel was welded to the receiver, and the uh, this piece the uh, take the cutoff was welded in place so that you couldn't remove the bolt. And the face of the bolt, pull this out, the face of the bolt was welded shut and the firing pin was broken off inside. Or ground off, I'm not sure which, but uh, if you pull the bolt out, I don't know if you'd be able to see it on this one or not, but on mine, you can see where they TIG welded. That, that's a good bolt. Oh, okay. <laughs> they TIG welded the firing pin back on. Uh, what they did was they just ground it back about that far so that it couldn't hit the weld in the front of the thing. Otherwise, the rifles were all, uh, you know, you could open the bolt and go through your routine and so on. And they put some kind of plug in the barrel uh, if you get one of these. Yeah, true, they were called drill rifles, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were they bought them yeah. uh, from the CMP, Gibbs uh, or Navy Arms and uh, Ohio, what is that, so G, I think it is. Yeah. They bought 1,800 drill rifles. They, the CMP couldn't sell them. Nobody wanted them. Yeah. So they bought, made a bid and they got the 1,800 and they started reworking the ones they could. A lot of them. Yeah, a lot of them, the weld especially the weld between the barrel and the receiver, ruined the receiver. Uh, and Mostly the, uh, some of those you could... The cutoff one was a bad one. And yeah, the, and a lot of them, when they welded the cutoff, they uh, also ruined the receiver there. Uh, I've seen a few of these, a uh, few of those, uh, 
where they, uh, oh, come on. And I know the first run of barrels were made by Pedersoli and the Mark GR, Gibbs Rifle Company. So I don't know, they, they made several runs, but the first run of barrels were made by Pedersoli. Yeah. Uh, my, my barrel says GB 2011. Yeah. Uh, Gibbs. Yeah. I'm not sure. But you've got the crown and the five on none. I know you have the crown on there at all. That's the other one. Yeah. But uh, what they did was they took rifles that they could repair and they refurbished the uh, receiver and they. Uh, Put, uh, took a regular stock bolt and they ground this out here, which is I think probably what they did with the regular row 3 A3 snipers. Uh, I don't think they made a special bolt for it. And uh, they put a, a brand new barrel on and uh, put a brand new stock on. This one has a C stock, one has a scant stock. Uh, this one, uh, and they, they used the Redfield sight base. This one covers up the uh, serial one, which is, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it covers up the serial Part of the serial one. Enough you can that's, read it. That's one of the ways you can tell if a made up. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A3, A3 action. The real, the real sniper, the serial number is way down here on the bottom, of the, right above the, this uh, cutout pump for the uh, extractor. Uh, this one's also got uh, two wardens marked on it, which means it was refurbished as a service for it sometime. But uh, that's basically what they did with them. Uh, they, they didn't bother uh, repairing the, the bolts that had been welded because the welding would destroy the locking lug uh, strength. They just uh, got bolts somewhere. Yeah, they got bolts. Yeah, and uh, mine, when you, if you look very carefully at the end of the firing pin, you can see where they welded. Uh, put some weld in there and then reshaped it into a firing pin. But on a lot of them, they just bought parts. Uh, firing pins tend to break in these. Um, so I imagine they weren't around. Uh, it's, it's easily procured. But uh, on mine, what they did was they ground part of the uh, scope mount the base off so that you can actually read the serial number on this one. There's no way you're going to read that serial number. And over here, they have it. Mark Gibbs on one. But otherwise, that's what they did. They had somebody reproduce the <coughs> The little weaver scope. And, uh, yep. and, uh, and uh, uh, probably Redfield produce the base and this rooms. But uh, I haven't shot mine. I don't know how well it shoots and whatnot. But the scope is fairly clear. That was just cool. I'll see through it. it. It looks pretty decent. It's maybe three pounds. Yeah. I know myself when I got my first 0383, you know, like, right, I got a sniper rifle, I got a sniper rifle. So I went up to a range at 100 yards, and at that time, ShopRite was selling lemon treat soda at 7 cents a can. So we used to buy it in quantity and shake it up on a hot day and put it out at 100 yards. And, uh, man, that was neat. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. uh, okay, I had a friend who worked with Hoffman LaRoche and 
he, he showed up one day with a bunch of hairspray uh, things that we used to put on your hair. And uh, we were shooting. And when you hit one of those, boy, it was really spectacular. <laughs> Well, this shoots pretty well. It will move the trees. It will move without an inch of a hundred yards. Yeah. But uh, I decided after I got this, I said, you know, I want something a little better than I built. Yeah, so show I built one. Yeah, show them the one you built. Now, I took it where I can. Where is this one? I can't remember. It took a while and I don't know if I should see it like that. I put a criterion barrel at the CMP salts. I had somebody snooker me years ago. They sold me a package of 10 03A3 volts. They weren't. They were A4 volts. <laughs> That's an original A4 volt. And I found out that uh, after I sold the fuel, they were about $400 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> Who got snookered? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I sold them for $100. <laughs> So uh, it, years later, having been snookered, and this is a Keystone stock, Criterion barrel, the original mount, red field mount, original rings, and a Leatherwood scope, Mark USMC and the 73 G4 Hilux. It's better than the original scope, but it's still two and a half power. And this will hold under three, three quarters of an inch or a hundred yards. <coughs> so that was my thing in building it. But when I built it, I put it all together, I couldn't get the smoke to line up. And I realized, and I found out later, that they used Redfield mounts. And they just, there were standard production mounts on these guns. And they didn't line up perfectly, so the government had a shoe kit right. that went underneath the front mount that raised the scope up enough so that it, you, you could sight it. So I made my own shins and put underneath it. And it shoots pretty well. I have another one in the process right now because I had a Keystone stock, I had another A4 bolt, I had another set of rings and mounts that I mount. I said I'll build another one. So that's almost finished. Out of a, a jump on 3A3. And somebody sporterized. Oh yeah, the sporterized. I, I can do something with that. <laughs> oh, well, it's just an old sporter here, you know. So I pulled it off and I had a high uh, uh, control of the barrel. Uh, and it shoots out of an A3. <laughs> okay. So the plate was my gears. And if you look here, you'll see the undercut on the on the base of the, 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 the scope base. Uh, and this is a four million one hundred or one thousand four million one hundred thirteen thousand seven ninety-six. I don't know who the manufacturer of the rifle is, but uh, at any rate, it's marked over here, Remington 0384, right there. Yep. And the barrel is not, it's pretty up here. It says, uh, it's GO. GO, the rifle. Yeah, and 2011. Uh, it's got the scant stock. It came with this sling, by the way, and uh, it's a scope, it says rifle scope M73G2, uh, Malcolm Hilux Optics, Gibbs Rifle Company. The, the base, the scope base is marked Gibbs Rifle. I mean, they made no attempt whatsoever to hide this right. as a repro. Um, and that's what you get. Yeah, now, they're pretty decent. Now it was interesting when they decided to go with this rifle. They the lesson they had learned from the First World War was with the Warner and Swayze, which was offset. You couldn't get a cheap weld or anything else. They eliminated the front sight. The, there's no backup sights, but you can get a better cheap weld with the scope mounted low the way it is. If you had if you had raised it and had a tunnel underneath for the iron sights, which like like the Germans did. Well, now you got a problem of you know where do you put your uh, your chin? Same with the Mosin Nagant. You got to you know strain yourself. Yeah. 
And the big change also was we get to Warner and Swayze, the argument was you have to load it with a stripper clip. They decided, no, you don't need to load stripper clips for the sniper. You know, put loose yeah. rounds in, yeah. and you're in business. Yeah, when, when Ralph or Jeff Jr. first started making them, he said, I had done some work for him. He uh -huh. said, I'll give you the first one that comes in. I said, no, no, I knew your dad too long. Give me the 10th or 20th one that came in after you worked the bugs out of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't decide to buy this until we didn't have a whole lot left. And uh, I decided to part with the... By, mm -hmm. by the way, that gives us for sale if anybody's ah, okay. <laughs> uh, to, a, uh, to a New Jersey licensed dealer. Yeah. Yeah. So. But the Gibbs rifles have become a collectible on their own because yeah. there's only, what, 1,800 made? Well, they made less than that because they yeah. couldn't sell They couldn't. Them couldn't. Them. Right. And actually, I mean, he got an order one time from the Coast Guard. They wanted a hundred drill rifles, so he <laughs> white plastic stocks on them and sold them to the Coast Guard. And they were all deactivated O3 Springfields going back to the Coast Guard for drill purposes. Yeah. Yeah. That's like when my junior ROTC unit I was with, for, well, I'm still with it. The first 10 years, they had M14s. Yeah. That was demilled. The Marines called them back in and they're working them over. But they had a plug in the barrel and the barrel was welded to the receiver yes. and the firing pin was chopped. And everything else worked, you could field strip it, everything else. Mm -hmm. But and the ones they couldn't, you know, they couldn't uh, reactivate, mm -hmm. they were selling them uh, to uh, so, uh, World War II rear actors. Mm -hmm. you know, there were rifles that were functioned, but they couldn't fire. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a couple of guys that bought those rifles in the DY. And they've actually put them back in the service. But what they eventually had to do is they had to go to the gun shows and pick up the uh, cutoff and the cutoff spindle because when they welded it, they wrecked both of those parts in the you know, once they deactivated, they basically put a spot roll on the barrel and the barrel was plugged. Mm -hmm. Everything else functioned and then they started doing the cutoff. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, the barrel, the barrel weld, if you were real careful with the dremel tool, you could cut that weld and take it off. And if the weld wasn't too bad, uh, it didn't ruin the heat treating on the, on the receiver ring. Uh, a lot of them just a little tap Yeah. You just dremel that. Yeah. And then screw the barrel and put another barrel on. Well, I've seen barrels for oh, around a hundred bucks, Springfield barrels. Uh, they're all used, but they're not in too bad a shape. Uh, yeah, that was the other thing I said. I, I've restored a good number of 03 A3s because in those days you went to Sarko. Yeah, you know, it was cheap, everything up. Now you go there, it's uh, well, you know, $200 for a long bit of cartouche. And, uh, yeah, in the 1960s, the government was selling off. Springfield parts. Yeah. And they had a whole parts list that you could buy parts. Yeah. I had a, a beat up red low number receiver. It's a treasure low number receiver. I didn't get a high number receiver. Yeah. Seven dollars and thirty cents. So I got this brand new high number receiver. I bought the barrel, I bought all the parts, and I put it together. Yeah, my very first M1 was a rewell, and you could tell by the crunch sound as it went over the rewell. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the CMP was like, if you send us a receiver and so much money, we'll send you a receiver with a barrel. Okay, I went to Sarko, they unscrewed my rewell receiver, put it in the box, boom, I come back and I get a... Then later on, they sent a memo, no rewell receivers. <laughs> <laughs> I take just about anything. Uh, I don't know if you know Craig Dennis. No. I brought back an M1 that came out of a rice pack in Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave it to him because he had it. Yeah. And uh, they offered to trade any unserviceable weapon for a good one. Uh -huh. They sent it out there, got a beautiful piece. <laughs> yeah. What do you I do? On eBay, I, I looked for PJL here and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was a floorboard 
CJ over here scoreboard. You know, Colonel so and so said that uh, sold and distributed by PJ over here, printed and distributed, Maplewood, New Jersey, folks. Six ninety five. Mm -hmm. So I buy this scorebook. What a wealth of information. Some guy in 1931, 32, and 33, it was like reading a book. All the pages were filled in. And I asked, this is fantastic. Where he shot at the Camp Perry, Plattsburgh, what ammunition he shot, what serial number rifle he shot, except the son of a gun never wrote his name in the book. <laughs> this is what he had because. And he shot some very, very good targets with uh, 1,300,000 Springfield. You know, you know what it had to be. Mm -hmm. And all his scores, and I said, this is better than a novel for me. I'm having a ball reading <laughs> a $6.95 yeah. cent. Yeah. And we had two weeks ago. Okay, guys, it's pretty 9.30. Anybody have any questions? I'm going to make sure you guys get home before the Nor'easter. Yeah. A spy, spy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the what? Yeah, the early ones. There was a uh, there was a question as to their heat treatment, the low number of spring fields. Uh, they were all proof tested. The real problem was usually ammunition related. Guys did dumb things like stick an eight millimeter round into it. Yeah, they, fought uh, the yeah, they fought the whole First World War with them. It was just an extra precaution because the Army had so many high-numbered ones that they just decided to not use the low-numbered ones. The Marine Corps just kept using them. Uh, most of, if, you, if you read the reports in Hatcher's book, most of them are ammunition related. There was some quality ammunition, a problem with quality ammunition in the First World War. And the only case they have of a high number Springfield, I think it was an 0383, blowing up with GI ammo was one that a guy bought and didn't take the Cosmoline out of the barrel. <laughs> one, of, one of the other problems with the ammunition, uh, some bullets, somehow or other, I don't know the whole story really, what happened was the bullets either got lumpo plated to the brass or some kind of thing like that, and the bullet pole was extremely hot. And I think that was national matching that they were using uh, back in the 20s, uh, in the late 20s. Well, this guy in 1931 was still shooting. Running for all of 1918. But then we went to Camp Perry in 1933. He was shooting uh, French with our soul national match. Yeah. 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 What happened was the, the bullet pole was so extreme on these that the pressures went out of sight and several guns were blown up because of that. So, uh, 